Welcome to the 2020 SI Leeds Literary Prize Award event. As you know, it's been a very, very unusual year this year, um, and this is first and hopefully the last time this event will only be presented online, but we're very, very pleased that you can join us. The SI Leeds Literary Prize is the only prize of its kind in the UK. It's for unpublished fiction by black and Asian women writers based in the UK, and the fact that it's for unpublished fiction is really, really important. Crucially, it means that our writers have complete freedom to write whatever they want without fear of publishing trends or expectations. Since the prize has been awarded, many of our writers have gone on to achieve both critical acclaim and commercial success. Hello, my name's Kit Devar, and I won the Reader's Choice Award of the SI Literary Prize in 2014. It was such a fantastic thing to win a prize when I was an unpublished author, and it made a huge difference, not only to my career, but also to my sense of myself as a writer. It was the first time that I'd won something that big and to be voted for by readers was really, really important to me. The importance of prizes can't be stressed enough for new writers. It gives you something to go to agents with. It's confirmation that someone apart from your mom thinks you're a great writer and it also gives you that little bit of a oomph, a shot in the arm that helps you carry on and helps you continue in your journey as a writer. And for many people, continue on to being published. I'd like to thank the prize for giving me the opportunity to feel that way, to feel that I was a real writer and also to be such an important stepping stone in my career. One of the unique features of the prize is the Prize Plus programme which we've developed to offer writers a range of opportunities they wouldn't normally have. This means in addition to the cash awards, they can receive one-to-one -one mentoring with literature professionals, opportunities to meet publishers and agents, they can receive manuscript assessment on their work, and also, crucially, they form a support network with each other. And in fact, many of our shortlisted writers have gone on to meet each other many years after the first award was made. It's really been fantastic to see the range and quality of work that we've received at the prize over the years, and also to see the impact that the prize is having on the industry. Hi, I am Badisha. I'm a broadcaster and filmmaker and a patron of the SI Leeds Literary Prize for Unpublished Fiction by Black and Asian Women Authors. As a patron, I am honoured to stand alongside many other women who support the prize, including the Booker Prize winning novelist Bernadine Evaristo, the journalist Yasmin Alibi Brown and the publishing world pioneer Margaret Busby. Black and Asian women are underrepresented throughout the publishing industry, not only as published authors and critics reviewing the work of others, but also within the industry itself as agents, as editors, as executives, and as all of the gatekeepers who have power and influence in the industry itself. These are structural issues, but they don't mean that black and Asian women's talent, ambition, determination and commitment don't exist. Every other year, the SI Leeds Literary Prize uncovers the voices that have been unseen and unheard and puts those voices in front of delighted readers. They don't just delight the authors who win the prize, they add something to that great world of readership and inspiration that's out there. The prize demonstrates, I think, the depth, the diversity and the richness of contemporary fiction. So let me close this short video by saying how much I congratulate and celebrate the long-listed, short-listed and winning authors of the 2020 SI Leeds Literary Prize. And I look forward to enjoying your careers in the years and the decades to come. I'm delighted to say that the range and quality of the work this year has been astonishing as ever and the judges have really, really enjoyed reading the work and found some very difficult decisions in choosing this shortlist. However, hearing the shortlisted writers is always a real highlight of the award event. We're very pleased to have this for you now. Please enjoy them. The Sun Sets in the East, Chapter 1, Beyond the Pale. At sundown, we ride to the bazaar in a bullock cart. 
The Calcutta roads are full of potholes and we lurch from side to side with every jolt and jar. Half digested haddock laps at the back of my throat. A poor choice of dinner eaten in haste. It must be that which makes my stomach churn, not fear of what's ahead. Baron lounges on the narrow bench opposite, his body angled so he can stretch out his legs. Like me, he wears indigo jamas and a matching choga, the better to go unnoticed. The borrowed skin suits him, but I chafe at the ill-fitting sleeves that end an inch above my wrist bones. I've got just the thing for you, Wharton, he says. Gratefully, I accept the proffered hip flask and take one long swig and then another. I do not underestimate the risk you take tonight, I say, but Baron shrugs it off. I know just the chap to help you. If anyone can give a clue to your friend's whereabouts, it's him. Besides, no soldier worth his sort can resist an adventure, especially if it's top secret, eh, Marshal? The younger man sitting alongside him smirks in response. He has ignored Baron's advice to dispense with his uniform and wears the familiar red coat and cream joppers of the East India Company's army. With his white blonde hair, he will stand out like a beacon. We'll get the savages talking for you, Reverend, he says, and I feel a sharp stab of dislike for him. The heavy beast is surprisingly swift, and as we move further from the city, I mark the changing scenery. In and around the centre of Calcutta and out towards Fort William, the roads are wide and clean. Ladies and gentlemen, pastel painted shops, barouche boxes and smart curricles. You could think yourself in York or Brighton, but for the chattering natives and the smell of spices. Beyond Sharangi there can be no such mistake. There is a wildness unfamiliar and untamable. Waist high grasses encroach on the roads, strange birds call from the trees overhead and a jackal screams in the near distance. The further we go, the fewer white faces we see, and for the first time in my life, I feel conspicuous. Hi, this is Sumana Khan, and my novel is The Good Twin. It is a crime thriller um, about a 16-year-old boy who shoots his twin brother dead. So was that an accident, was, or was there something more to it? This is an excerpt from the beginning of the book. The boy lay slumped against the wall. Apart from bits of nasal cartilage and a hanging lower jaw, most of the face had disintegrated. The wall behind glistened and dripped with blood and tissue. The rest of the body was intact, with specks of blood on the boy's blue and green striped t-shirts and blue jeans. The discarded shell of a bullet was in the middle of the room. A pistol lay before the awkwardly bent right leg of the body. The crotch area was wet. No doubt the body had expelled everything it had held inside in the split-second death spasm. The smell of feces was overpowering in the boxed room. It was a windowless show, uh, storage room, about 15 feet by 10 feet, lit by an LED tube light. On either side of the door, the two walls were lined with wooden shelves, packed with overflowing cardboard boxes. Point-blank shot, big as caliber. There must be an exit wound going by the bloody bloom on the wall, Sunil Shastri thought as he withdrew from the threshold of the room. Position of the gun was wrong with respect to the discarded casing. He breathed deeply into the handkerchief pressed against his mouth. Despite being the primary investigator with the Bangalore Crime Investigation Unit for over five years, Sunil could never get used to messy crime scenes. That too, this was just a boy, barely out of his teens. Besides, no one ever really got used to the smell of shit. From somewhere within the sprawling house, a constant wailing rose and fell and Sunil had goosebumps. This was his first case after the suspension. He wished he could have eased back into something less traumatic. Stolen mobiles, for example. Sunil looked at his watch, 9.15pm. He was the first to arrive on the scene. The boy had been dead for just over half an hour going by boss's call. The forensics team was yet to arrive. It would easily take them another half an hour in the Bangalore traffic. Sunil took out his pocket notebook and walked towards Commissioner Vaswani, who was standing at the far end of the corridor, staring at the ceiling. Sunil wondered what the Commissioner of Bangalore Police was doing here. The Commissioner had, Sunil's, had called Sunil's boss, Gyanendra Hegde, to report the death. 
Then Hegde had called Sunil and Sunil was getting ready for the New Year's Eve party. Banana milkshake and paneer biryani at a highway dhaba on NH7. Sunil cleared his throat and Vaswani nodded. The forensics team should be here soon, sir. I'd like to take your statement, meanwhile, if you're up to it. Let's go to the living room, Vaswani said. Sunil pursed his lips as he followed Vaswani. Everyone knew Vaswani was given to dramatic performances now and then. The Funeral Crier Great-great-grandma was dead. She had been 106 years old. The whole village was touched by an eerie atmosphere of relief. It seemed as if everyone had been tacitly waiting for this moment to arrive. She had been great-great-grandma to everyone in the village. She seemed to have lived forever and she would never die. I felt a taint of surreptitious excitement and a shameful buzz in my chest since I would earn some money from her epic death. A young woman wearing a white linen gown approached me in the crammed kitchen. Several village chefs and their helpers were preparing food amid much shouting and chopping. I could hardly move as I was surrounded by stacks of large cardboard boxes with fragile porcelain printed on them. Can you really make everyone cry? Yes. Sorry, but I'm a bit worried. If people aren't sad enough, my uncle will be mad at me. She did sound a little worried. Don't worry, you'll see lots of tears. I took a brief look at myself in the mirror. My face was pale. My eyebrows were painted along and my lips were bright red. My bum was neat and high, and there were some strands of hair along my temples and beside my ears to cover my wrinkles. The courtyard was spacious but neglected, with weeds squeezing through the gaps between the chipped stone slabs. The guests were mostly sitting on small stools and benches. Some people were chatting, some were staring at their phones, and some were cracking sunflower seeds. There was no sorrow or grief in the air yet. Most people wore indifferent expressions. When someone died at such an age, there would be a sense of detachment for the funeral goer. It was something along the lines of, oh, I wish I could live for so long. So, self-pity overwhelmed the morning. It took me two hours to get ready. I removed every single hair that could be deemed unfeminine, even though I don't believe in any of that. I painted my toenails and fingernails. I spent time on my makeup. I bothered with eyeshadow and added mascara to my usual eyeliner. I used a brush on my eyebrows, blusher, lipstick, the works. Then I put on this fitted black dress bought especially for the occasion. It accentuated all my curves. I don't usually notice that sort of thing, but on the way to meet Alex, I got a lot of looks. One guy even said, you're lovely, but he was standing outside the betting shop, so it didn't count. Alex was already waiting for me when I got to the restaurant. I handed the waiter my coat and sat down. Alex smiled and said, it was nice to meet me. He didn't mention my appearance at all. We ordered starters, camembert for him, tiger prawns for me. For the main, I chose the sea bass and he went for Wagyu sirloin steak, medium rare. The wine arrived, a bottle of his choice, and it was good, though drier than I would have liked. We ate our starters, 
talking about politics and the climate. As soon as the plates were cleared, he said, So, you're friends with Lily? Yeah, we work together. Has she said anything about me? I took a breath and glanced down at the table. She said, you're her brother's friend, good looking. She wasn't lying about that. I smiled and so did he. She said you were bright, funny and ambitious and had just set up your own business. His smile grew bigger. She's something else. I nodded slowly, the heat rising inside. Our waiter brought over his steak and my sea bass. She's absolutely stunning, you know? White women are always trying to tan themselves to look like that. The long wavy hair and the figure, it's hard because she's my best friend's little sister, but she's the kind of woman you marry. I swallowed a few times to try and stop the heat from rising, but it wouldn't stay down. I focused on Alex's steak and tried to calm myself but a burning pressure was building in my throat, making my eyes water. The burning rushed into my mouth. I bit my lips, tried to hold it back, but my mouth opened and fire shot out, engulfing the table in red, orange and yellow flames. All was quiet and all was still. The heralds lay charred in their cot beds. The princes betrayed them. The termites attacked. The anthills sit empty. Her workers scatter. Mothers, fathers, babes, until ruin swallows all of their names. Silence. No one calls you. No one remembers your face. No one remembers your name. It is only the dust that is yet to settle that coats the nostrils and the lungs, that fogs the mind. The memory is gone, and we are alone, yet we are many. Those who took heed made records. Those who took records took heed. They lay prostrate to new kings or dead at their feet. We cannot remember all. We cannot remember. Mbwipe Market, 1471 AD. There are no friends waiting for you in Bonomanso. Ya twiddled a tight coil of hair at the nape of her neck to calm herself down. There were too many people clumped together. Too much rubbing of bare skin. She had stopped counting the number of times she'd been knocked over by Buipe's inconsiderate market folk. She stood shoulder height with the masses, while traders hollered their prices in the late morning heat. She struggled to keep up with the rest of her travelling party, her grandfather Nana Beni, his old friend, the Muslim scholar, al Haji. Her hands pressed on the table stalls for balance as the wave of people attempted to separate her from her guardians. The table stretched in two narrow rows filled with produce in bras and earthenware bowls. Occasionally the densely packed rows of tables were punctuated by sellers engaging customers from the ground up. They sat on mats next to large pans of spices, sacks of ground nuts or hulled millet. Her eyes darted past them in blurry colours, purple cola nuts, white garden eggs, green and yellow scotch bonnets and bright red tomatoes. No sooner had she blinked, she had lost it. This is an extract from my short story, Waterlogged, which appears in my collection of short stories, Things We Do Not Tell the People We Love. 
She had settled for him knowingly because she was so tired of being alone, of waiting for her situation to change. The truth was she'd been in love with someone else for years ever since university, but this boy, Leon, never took her seriously enough. She was never officially his girlfriend, merely his bookend, the one he came back to in between everyone else. Every time he drifted away again, she sat in her pale blue nightgown crying at the kitchen table while her housemates made her cups of tea and told her he was a dick anyway and she deserved better. Everywhere she looked, everyone else was getting married. One by one, her flatmates moved out to move in with long-term boyfriends who would sooner or later become their fiancés. When she finally told Leon that it had always been him and she asked him to commit, aware that she sounded like a teenage girl suggesting they go steady, he put his hands to the side of her face and said earnestly, Darling, let's talk about this tonight. But tonight never came because he never called and never again picked up his phone whenever she rang him. The idea of him was a fantasy. Leon would never have done what he'd have to do to be accepted by her family anyway. In the end, oblivious to, her da to their daughter's heartache, her parents found her room for her. Harun and Shauna had only known each other for 18 months before Rafi was born, 16 of those as husband and wife. He proposed, or rather his parents did, after they had met just three times, twice of those in the presence of their families, and a swift two-month engagement followed. After years of rejecting similar suitors, mostly because of Leon, Shauna was swayed to marry Harun by the prose she carried in her head, all the things she felt ashamed of thinking about. At least he shared her background. At least he lived alone. At least she wouldn't have to move in with in-laws she didn't know. Sometimes she thought that she could love him, if only he toned it all down a little, if only he noticed the little things about her, like how she liked to be held in bed, or how she loved to have someone tuck her hair behind her ear, or if he ever paid attention to the books she liked to read. Harun was not a reader, he didn't have time for fiction, he said. Of all things, maybe it was this that Shauna regretted the most, that he lacked imagination, that he didn't see beauty or poetry or the possibility of love in unobvious, subtle things. But Shauna had known all this about him, she had accepted the certainty of this way of life over the unknown of waiting for Leon to change. She had always thought that she could live with it, that the stability of a family she could call her own would in some way make up for it. But more and more, there were days when she was no longer sure. Hello. My name is Nicola Chang and I'm head judge of the 2020 SI Leeds Prize. I'd first like to extend my thanks, first and foremost, to all the writers who submitted to the prize. To my fellow judges, Khadija George, Malaika Booker and Yvonne Singh, and to Fiona Goh, director of the prize, as well as the whole team working hard behind the scenes to pull this off during such a challenging time. Unsurprisingly, the quality and calibre of the submissions we received presented us with an embarrassment of riches, so much so that choosing a reader, and indeed a short list of three, was not an easy task. I have been so inspired and impressed with the ambition and craft of all these works of fiction, and I first wanted to congratulate all the writers who made it onto the long list. Now, onto the hard part. The best fiction is timely and timeless. It lingers with you long after you close the proverbial cover. The shortlisted writers accomplished all this and more, and they should be incredibly proud of their work. So, without further ado, the SI Reader's Choice Award for the favourite submission from the shortlist, chosen by over 40 readers, including members of Soroptimist International, goes to Samana Khan for The Good Twin. And now to the shortlist and winner. In third place is Samana Khan for The Good Twin, a sharp, pacey, confident crime novel set in modern day Bangalore. In second place is Ellen Dillsworth for The Sun Sets in the East, a great social novel set in 19th century colonial India. And the, the Aspirogen first prize winner of the SI Leeds Literary Prize 2020 is Wen Yan Lu, for the funeral cry, 
a brilliant psychodrama set in a far-flung backwater of China, a portrait of female desire, not often seen, and of a village no longer inured to the pernicious forces of progress. Congratulations to you all. Hello, I'm Wenya Lu. Um, years back, I would never ever thought or dream that I would win this prize. And I was so excited and uh, speechless when I heard the news. And I stood, kind of don't believe it. Um, but at the same time, I'm actually more grateful than anything else. I want to say thank you to all the judges and the, to the organizers of the Leeds Literary Prize, especially many thanks to Fiona. She's done so much for us. And many special thanks to the other shortlisted writers. I, I felt like uh, we were connected and uh, we have met each other virtually, but I feel this is uh, such a lovely writing community. I know there are people like me. And uh, the reason why I didn't think I would win was they were so brilliant. And I want to tell them we're all winners. And I also, I want to say thank you to all the people who have encouraged me through my journey. And I want to tell people who doubt their writing, keep writing, don't worry. Don't think about what you are writing about and just do it.